Remember to check out my Patreon page, link in the description, for loads more amazing content, including full audiobooks. Heroes of Olympus, The Mark of Athena, by Rick Riordan. Chapter 1. Annabeth. Until she met the exploding statue, Annabeth thought she was prepared for anything. She'd paced the deck of their flying warship, the Argo 2, checking and double-checking the ballastate to make sure they were locked down. She'd confirmed that the white, we come in peace flag was flying from the mast. She'd reviewed the plan with the rest of the crew, and the backup plan, and the backup plan for the backup plan. Most importantly, she'd pulled aside their war-crazed chaperone, Coach Gleason Hedge, and encouraged him to take the morning off in his cabin and watch reruns of mixed martial arts championships. The last thing they needed as they flew a magical Greek terim into a potentially hostile Roman camp was a middle-aged satyr in gym clothes waving a club and yelling, DIE! Everything seemed to be in order. Even that mysterious chill she'd been feeling since the ship launched had dissipated, at least for now. The warship descended through the clouds, but Annabeth couldn't stop second-guessing herself. What if this was a bad idea? What if the Romans panicked and attacked them on sight? The Argo too definitely did not look friendly. 200 feet long with a bronze-plated hull, mounted repeating crossbows fore and aft, a flaming metal dragon for a figurehead and two rotating ballastae amidships that could fire explosive bolts powerful enough to blast through concrete. Well, it wasn't the most appropriate ride for a meet and greet with the neighbours. Annabeth had tried to give the Romans a heads up. She'd asked Leo to send one of his special inventions, a holographic scroll, to alert their friends inside the camp. Hopefully the message had got through. Leo had wanted to paint a giant message on the bottom of the hull. What's up? With a smiley face, but Annabeth vetoed the idea. She wasn't sure the Romans had a sense of humour. Too late to turn back now. The clouds broke around their hull, revealing the gold and green carpet of the Oakland Hills below them. Annabeth gripped one of the bronze shields that lined the starboard rail. Her three crewmates took their places. On the stern quarterdeck, Leo rushed around like a madman, checking his gauges and wrestling levers. Most hel helmsmen would have been satisfied with a pilot's wheel or a tiller. Leo had also installed a keyboard, monitor, aviation controls from a Learjet, a dubstep soundboard and motion control sensors from a Nintendo Wii. He could turn the ship by pulling on the throttle, fire weapons by sampling an album or raise sails by shaking his Wii controllers really fast. Even by demigod standards, Leo was seriously ADHD. Piper paced back and forth between the mainmast and the ballastay, practising her lines. Lower your weapons, she murmured. We just want to talk. Her charm speak was so powerful that the words flowed over Annabeth, filling her with the desire to drop her dagger and have a nice long chat. For a child of Aphrodite, Piper tried hard to play down her beauty. Today she was dressed in tattered jeans, worn out trainers and a white tank top with a pink Hello Kitty design. Maybe as a joke, though Annabeth could never be sure with Piper. Her choppy brown hair was braided down the right side with an eagle's feather. Then there was Piper's boyfriend, Jason. He stood at the bow on the raised crossbow platform, where the Romans could easily spot him. His knuckles were white on the hilt of his golden sword. Otherwise, he looked calm for a guy who was making himself a target. Over his jeans and orange camp half-blood t-shirt, he donned a toga and a purple cloak, symbols of his old rank as Praetor. With his wind-ruffled blonde hair and his icy blue eyes, he looked ruggedly handsome in a, and in control, just like a son of Jupiter should. He'd grown up at Camp Jupiter, so hopefully his familiar face would make the Roman, Romans hesitant to blow the ship out of the sky. Annabeth tried to hide it, but she still didn't completely trust the guy. He acted too perfectly, always followed the rules, always doing the honourable thing. He'd even look too perfect. In the back of her mind, she had a nagging thought. What if this is a trick and he betrays us? What if we sail into Camp Jupiter and he says, Hey Romans, check out these prisoners and this cool ship I bought you. Annabeth doubted that would happen. Still, she couldn't look at him without getting a bitter taste in her mouth. He'd been part of Hera's forced exchange programme to introduce the two camps. Her most annoying majesty, Queen of Olympus, had convinced the other gods that their two sets of children, Roman and Greek, had to combine forces to save the world from the evil goddess Gaia, who was awakening from the earth, and her horrible children, the giants. Without warning, Hera had plucked up Percy Jackson, Annabeth's boyfriend, wiped his memory and sent him to the Roman camp. In exchange, the Greeks had got Jason. None of that was Jason's fault, but every time Annabeth saw him, she remembered how much she missed Percy. Percy, who was somewhere below them right now. Oh, gods. Panic welled up inside her. She forced it down. She couldn't afford to get overwhelmed. I'm a child of Athena, she told herself. I have to stick to my plan, not get distracted. She felt it again. That familiar shiver, as if a psychotic snowman had crept up behind her and was breathing down her neck. She turned, but no one was there. Must be her nerves. 
Even in a world of gods and monsters, Annabeth couldn't believe a new warship would be haunted. The Argo too was well protected, the celestial bronze shields along the rail were enchanted to ward off monsters, and their onboard satyr, Coach Hedge, would have sniffed out, sniffed out any intruders. Annabeth wished she could pray to her mother for guidance, but that wasn't possible now. Not after last month, when she'd had that horrible encounter with her mum and got the worst present of her life. The cold pressed closer. She thought she heard a faint voice in the wind, laughing. Every muscle in her body tensed. Something was about to go terribly wrong. She almost ordered Leo to reverse. Then in the valley below, horns sounded. The Romans had spotted them. Annabeth thought she knew what to expect. Jason had described Camp Jupiter to her in great detail. Still, she had trouble believing her eyes. Ringed by the Oakland Hills, the valley was at least twice the size of Camp Halfblood. A small river snaked around one side and curled towards the centre like a capital letter G, emptying into a sparkling blue lake. Directly below the ship, nestled at the edge of the lake, the city of New Rome gleamed in the sunlight. She recognised landmarks Jason had told her about. The Hippodrome, the Colosseum, the temples and parks, the neighbourhood of Seven Hills with its winding streets, colourful villas and flowering gardens. She saw evidence of the Romans' recent battle with an army of monsters. The dome was cracked open on a building she guessed was the Senate House. The Forum's broad plaza was pitted with craters. Some fountains and statues were in ruins. Dozens of kids in togas were streaming out of the Senate House to get a better view of the Argo too. More Romans emerged from the shops and cafes, gawking and pointing as the ship descended. About half a mile to the west, where the horns were blowing, a Roman fort stood on a hill. It looked just like the illustrations Annabeth had seen in military history books, with a defensive trench lined with spikes, high walls and watchtowers, armed with scorpion ballastae. Inste inside, perfect rows of white barracks lined the main road, the Via Principalis. A column of demigods emerged from the gates, their armour and spears glinting as they hurried towards the city. In the midst of their ranks was an actual war elephant. Annabeth wanted to land the Argo too before these troops arrived, but the ground was still several hundred feet below. She scanned the crowd, hoping to catch a glimpse of Percy. Then something behind her went boom. The explosion almost knocked her overboard. She whirled and found herself eye to eye with an angry statue. Unacceptable, he shrieked. Apparently, he had exploded into existence right there on the deck. Sulfurous yellow smoke rolled out of his shoulders. Cinders popped around his curly hair. From the waist down, he was nothing but a square marble pedestal. From the waist up, he was a muscular human figure in a carved toga. I will not have weapons inside the Pomeranian line, he announced in a fussy teacher voice. I certainly will not have Greeks. Jason shot Annabeth a look that said, I've got this. Terminus, he said. It's me, Jason Grace. Oh, I remember you, Jason, Terminus grumbled. I thought you had better sense than to consort with the enemies of Rome. But they're not enemies. That's right, Piper jumped in. We just want to talk, if we could. Ha! snapped the statue. Don't try that charm speak on me, young lady, and put down that dagger before I slap it out of your hands. Piper glanced at her bronze dagger, which she'd apparently forgotten she was holding. Um, okay, but how would you slap it? Uh, you don't have any arms. Impertinence! There was a sharp pop and a flash of yellow. Piper yelped and dropped the dagger, which was now smoking and sparking. Lucky for you, I've just been through a battle, Terminus announced. If I were at full strength, I would have blasted this flying monstrosity out of the sky already. Hold up, Leo stepped forward, wagging his Wii controller. Did you just call my ship a monstrosity? I know you didn't do that. The idea that Leo might attack the statue with his gaming device was enough to snap Annabeth out of her shock. Let's all calm down. She raised her hands to show she had no weapons. I take it you're Terminus, the god of boundaries. Jason told me you protect the city of New Rome, right? I'm Annabeth Chase, daughter of... Oh, I know who you are. The statue glared at her with its blank white eyes. A child of Athena. Minerva's Greek form. Scandalous. You Greeks have no sense of decency. We Romans know the proper place for that goddess. Annabeth clenched her jaw. The statue wasn't making it easy to be diplomatic. What exactly do you mean, that goddess? And what's so scandalous about... Right, Jason interrupted. Anyway, Terminus, uh, we're here on a mission of peace. We'd love permission to land so we can... Impossible, the god squeaked. Lay down your weapons and surrender. Leave my city immediately. Which is it? Leo asked. Surrender or leave? Both, Terminus said. Surrender and then leave. I am slapping your face for asking such a stupid question, you ridiculous boy. Do you feel that? Wow. Leo studied Terminus with pro pro professional interest. You're wound up pretty tight. You got any gears in there that need loosening? I could take a look. He exchanged the Wii controller for a screwdriver from his magic tool belt and tapped the statue's pedestal. Stop that, 
Terminus insisted. Another small explosion made Leo drop his screwdriver. Weapons are not allowed on Roman soil inside the Pomerian line. The, the what? Piper asked. City limits, Jason translated. And this entire ship is a weapon, Terminus said. You cannot land. Down in the valley, the Legion reinforcements were halfway to the city. The crowd in the forum was over a hundred strong now. Annabeth scanned the faces and, oh gods, she saw him. He was walking towards the ship with his arms around two other kids, like they were best buddies. A stout boy with a black buzz cut and a girl wearing a Roman cavalry helmet. Percy looked so at ease, so happy. He wore a purple cape just like Jason's, the mark of a praetor. Annabeth's heart did a gymnastics routine. Leo, stop the ship, she ordered. What? You heard me. Keep us right where we are. Leo pulled out his controller and yanked it upward. All ninety oars froze in place. The ship stopped sinking. Terminus, Annabeth said. There's no, no rule against hovering over New Rome, is there? The statue frowned. Well, well, no. We can keep the ship to loft, Annabeth said. We'll use a rope ladder to reach the forum. That way the ship won't be on Roman soil. Not technically. The statue seemed to ponder this. Annabeth wondered if he was catching his, scratching his chin with imaginary hands. I like technicalities, he admitted. Still, all our weapons will still stay aboard the ship, Annabeth promised. I assume the Romans, even those reinforcements marching towards us, will also have to honour your rules inside the Pomerian line, if you tell them to. Of course, Terminus said. Do I look like I tolerate rule breakers? Uh, Annabeth, Leo said. You sure this is a good idea? She closed her fist to keep them from shaking. That cold feeling was still there. It floated just behind her, and now that Terminus was no longer shouting and causing explosions, she thought she could hear the presence laughing, as if it were delighted by the bad choices she was making. But Percy was down there. He was so close. She had to reach him. It'll be fine, she said. No one will be armed. We can talk in peace. Terminus will make sure each side obeys the rules. She looked at the marble statue. Do we have an agreement? Terminus sniffed. I suppose, for now, you may climb down your ladder to New Rome, daughter of Athena. Please try not to destroy my town. Chapter 2. Annabeth A sea of hastily assembled demigods parted for Annabeth as she walked through the forum. Some looked tense, some nervous, some were bandaged from their recent battle with the giants, but no one was armed, no one attacked. Entire families had gathered to see the newcomers, Annabeth saw couples with babies, toddlers clinging to their parents' legs, even some elderly folks in a combination of Roman robes and modern clothes. Were all of them demigods? Annabeth suspected so, though she'd never seen a place like this. At Camp Half-Blood, most demigods were teens. If they survived long enough to graduate from high school, they either stayed on as counsellors or left to start lives as best they could in the mortal world. Here, it was an entire multi-generational community. At the far end of the crowd, Annabeth spotted Tyson, the Cyclops, and Percy's hellhound, Mrs. O'Leary, who had been the first scouting party from Camp Half-Blood to reach Camp Jupiter. They looked to be in good spirits. Tyson waved and grinned. He was wearing an SPQR banner like a giant bib. Some part of Annabeth's mind registered how beautiful the city was. The smells from the bakeries, the gurgling fountains, the flowers blooming in the gardens, and the architecture. Gods, the architecture, gilded marble columns, dazzling mosaics, monumental arches and terraced villas. In front of her, the demigods made way for a girl in full Roman armour and a purple cape. Dark hair tumbled across her shoulders. Her eyes were as black as obsidian. Raina. Jason had described her well. Even without that, Annabeth would have singled her out as the leader. Medals decorated her armour. She carried herself with such confidence the other demigods backed away and averted their gaze. Annabeth recognised something else in her face too, in the hard set of her mouth and the deliberate way she raised her chin like she was ready to accept any challenge. Raina was forcing a look of courage while holding back a mixture of hopefulness and worry and fear that she couldn't show in public. Annabeth knew that expression. She saw it every time she looked in the mirror. The two girls considered each other. Annabeth's friends fanned out on either side. The Romans murmured Jason's name, staring at him in awe. Then someone else appeared from the crowd and Annabeth's vision tunnelled. Percy smiled at her, that sarcastic, troublemaker smile that had annoyed her for years but eventually had become endearing. His sea-green eyes were as gorgeous as she remembered. His dark hair was swept to one side, like he'd just come from a walk on the beach. He looked even better than he had six months ago, more tanned and taller, leaner and more muscular. Annabeth was too stunned to move. She felt that if she got any closer to him, all the molecules in her body might combust. She'd secretly had a crush on him since they were 12 years old. Last summer, 
She'd fallen for him hard. They'd been a happy couple for four months. And then he disappeared. During their separation, something had happened to Annabeth's feelings. They'd grown painfully intense, like she'd been forced to withdraw from a life-saving medication. Now she wasn't sure which was more excruciating, living with that horrible absence or being with him again. The praetor, Raina, straightened. With apparent reluctance, she turned towards Jason. Jason Grace, my former colleague. She spoke the word colleague like it was a dangerous thing. I welcome you home, and these, your friends. Annabeth didn't mean to, but she surged forward. Percy rushed towards her at the same time. The crowd tensed. Some reached for swords that weren't there. Percy threw his arms around her. They kissed, and for a moment nothing else mattered. An asteroid could have hit the planet and wiped out all life, and Annabeth wouldn't have cared. Percy smelled of ocean air. His lips were salty. Seaweed brain, she thought giddily. Percy pulled away and studied her face. Gods, I never thought... Annabeth grabbed his wrist and flipped him over her shoulder. He slammed into the paving stones. Romans cried out. Some surged forward, but Raina shouted, Hold! Stand down! Annabeth put her knee on Percy's chest. She pushed her forearm against his throat. She didn't care what the Romans fought. A white-hot lump of anger expanded in her chest. A tumour of worry and bitterness that she'd been carrying around since last autumn. If you ever leave me again, she said, her eyes stinging. I swear to all the gods. Percy had the nerve to laugh. Suddenly the lump of heated emotions melted inside Annabeth. Consider me warned, Percy said. I missed you too. Annabeth rose and helped him to his feet. She wanted to kiss him again so badly, but she managed to restrain herself. Jason cleared his throat. So, yeah, it's, it's good to be back. He introduced Raina to Piper, who looked a little miffed that she hadn't got to say the line she'd been practising, then to Leo, who grinned and flashed a peace sign. And this is Annabeth, Jason said. Uh, normally she doesn't judo flip people. Raina's eyes sparkled. You sure you're not a Roman, Annabeth, or an Amazon? Annabeth didn't know if that was a compliment, but she held out her hand. I only attack my boyfriend like that, she promised. Pleased to meet you. Raina clasped her hand firmly. It seems we have a lot to discuss. Centurions. A few of the Roman campers hustled forward. Apparently the senior officers. Two kids appeared at Percy's side, the same ones Annabeth had seen him chumming around with earlier. The burly Asian guy with the buzz cut was about 15. He was cute in a sort of oversized, cuddly panda bear way. The girl was younger, maybe 13, with amber eyes and chocolate skin and long curly hair. Her cavalry helmet was tucked under her arm. Annabeth could tell from their body language that they felt close to Percy. They stood next to him protectively, like they'd already shared many adventures. She fought down a twinge of jealousy. Was it possible Percy and this girl? No, no, the chemistry between the three of them wasn't like that. Annabeth had spent her whole life learning to read people. It was a survival skill. If she had to guess, she'd say the big Asian guy was the girl's boyfriend, though that she suspected they hadn't been together long. There was one thing she didn't understand. What was the girl staring at? She kept frowning in Piper and Leo's direction, like she recognised one of them, and the memory was painful. Meanwhile, Raina was giving orders to her officers. Tell the Legion to stand down. Dakota, alert the spirits in the kitchen. Tell them to prepare a welcome feast. And Octavian... You're letting these intruders into camp. A tall guy with stringy blonde hair elbowed his way forward. Rayner, the security risks. We're not taking them to the camp, Octavian. Rayner flashed him a stern look. We'll eat here in the forum. Oh, much better, Octavian grumbled. He seemed to be the only one who didn't defer to Rayner as his superior, despite the fact that he was a scrawny, pale, and for some reason had three teddy bears hanging from his belt. You want us to relax in the shadow of their warship? These are our guests. Raina clipped off every word. We will welcome them, and we will talk to them. As Augur, you should be... You should burn an offering to thank the gods for bringing Jason back to us safely. Good idea, Percy put in. Go burn your bears, Octavian. Raina looked like she was trying not to smile. You have my orders. Go. The officers dispersed. Octavian shot Percy a look of absolute loathing, and then he gave Annabeth a suspicious once-over and stalked away. Percy slipped his hand into Annabeth's. Don't worry about Octavian, he said. Most of the Romans are good people, like Frank and Hazel here, and Rayner. We'll be fine. Annabeth felt as if someone had draped a cold washcloth across her neck. She heard that whispering laughter again, as if the presence had followed her from the ship. She looked up at the Argo too. Its massive bronze hull glittered in the sunlight. Part of her wanted to kidnap Percy right now, climb on board and get out of here while they still could. She couldn't shake the feeling that something was about to go terribly wrong, and there was no way she would ever risk losing Percy again. We'll be fine, she repeated, trying to believe it. Excellent, Rayner said. 
She turned to Jason, and Annabeth thought there was a hungry sort of gleam in her eyes. Let's talk, and we can have a proper reunion. Chapter 3. Annabeth Annabeth wished she had an appetite, because the Romans knew how to eat. Sets of couches and low tables were carted into the forum until it resembled a furniture showroom. Romans lounged in groups of ten or twenty, talking and laughing while wind spirits, or I, swirled overhead, bringing an endless assortment of pizzas, sandwiches, chips, cold drinks and fresh-baked cookies. Drifting through the crowd were purple ghosts, lairs in togas and legionnaire armour. Around the edges of the feasts, satyrs, no, fawns, Annabeth thought, trotted from table to table, panhandling for food and spare change. In the nearby fields, the war elephant frolicked with Mrs O'Leary, and children played tag around the statues of Terminus that lined the city limits. The whole scene was so familiar, yet so completely alien, that it gave Annabeth vertigo. All she wanted to do was to be with Percy, preferably alone. She knew she would have to wait. If their quest was going to succeed, they needed these Romans, which meant getting to know them and building some goodwill. Rayner and a few of her officers, including the blonde kid Octavian, freshly back from burning a teddy bear for the gods, sat with Annabeth and her crew. Percy joined them with his two new friends, Frank and Hazel. As a tornado of food platters settled onto the table, Percy leaned over and whispered, I want to show you around New Rome, just you and me. The place is incredible. Annabeth should have just felt thrilled. Just you and me was exactly what she wanted. Instead, resentment swelled in her throat. How could Percy talk so enthusiastically about this place? What about Camp Half-Blood? Their camp? Their home? She tried not to stare at the new marks on Percy's forearm, an SPQR tattoo like Jason's. At Camp Half-Blood, demigods got bead necklaces to commemorate years of training. Here the Romans burned a tattoo into your flesh, as if to say you belong to us, permanently. She swallowed back some biting comments. Uh, okay, sure. I've been thinking, he said nervously. I had this idea. He stopped as Rayner called a toast to friendship. After introductions all around, the Romans and Annabeth's crew began exchanging stories. Jason explained how he'd arrived at Camp Half-Blood without his memory, and how he'd gone on a quest with Piper and Leo to rescue the goddess Hera, or Juno, take your pick. She was equally annoying in Greek or Roman, from imprisonment at the Wolf House in Northern California. Impossible, Octavian broke in. That's our most sacred place. If the giants had imprisoned a goddess there, they would have destroyed her. Piper said, and blamed it on the Greeks and started a war between the camps. Now be quiet and let Jason finish. Octavian opened his mouth, but no sound came out. Annabeth really loved Piper's charm speak. She noticed Rayner looking back and forth between Jason and Piper. Her brow creased, as if just re beginning to realise the two of them were a couple. So, Jason continued, that's how we found out about the Earth Goddess Gaia. She's still half asleep, but she's the one freeing the monsters from Tartarus and raising the giants. Porphyrian, the big leader dude, we fought at the Wolf House. He said he was retreating to the ancient lands, Greece itself. He plans on awakening Gaia and destroying the gods by, what did he call it? Pulling up their roots. Percy nodded thoughtfully. Gaia's been busy over here too. We had our own encounter with Queen Dirtface. Percy recounted his side of the story. He talked about waking up at the Wolf House with no memories except for one name, Annabeth. When she heard that, Annabeth had to try hard not to cry. Percy told them how he'd travelled to Alaska with Frank and Hazel, how they defeated the giant Alsonius, freed the death god Phanatos, and returned with the lost golden eagle standard of the Roman camp to repel an attack by the giant's army. When Percy had finished, Jason whistled appreciatively. No wonder they made you praetor. Octavian snorted. Which means we now have three praetors. The rules clearly state we can only have two. On the bright side, Percy said, both Jason and I outrank you, Octavian, so we can both tell you to shut up. Octavian turned as purple as a Roman t-shirt. Jason gave Percy a fist bump. Even Rayner managed to smile, though her eyes were stormy. We'll have to figure out the extra praetor problem later, she said. Right now, we have more serious issues to deal with. I'll step aside for Jason, Percy said easily. It's no biggie. No biggie, Octavian choked. The praetorship of Rome is no biggie. Percy ignored him and turned to Jason. You're Thalia Grace's brother, huh? Wow, you guys look nothing alike. Yeah, I noticed, Jason said. Anyway, thanks for helping my camp while I was gone. You did an awesome job. Back at you, Percy said. Annabeth kicked his shin. She hated to interrupt a budding bromance, but Rayner was right. They had serious things to discuss. We should talk about the Great Prophecy. It sounds like the Romans are aware of it too. Rayner nodded. We call it the Prophecy of Seven. Octavian, you have it committed to memory? Of course, he said. Uh, but Rayner, recite it, please, in English, not Latin. 
Octavian sighed. <sighs> Seven half-bloods shall answer the call. To storm or fire the world must fall. An oath to keep with a final breath, Annabeth continued, and foes bear arms to the doors of death. Everyone stared at her, except for Leo, who had constructed a pinwheel out of aluminium foil, taco wrappers, and was sticking it into passing wind spirits. Annabeth wasn't sure why she had blurted out the lines of the prophecy. She just felt compelled. The big kid, Frank, sat forward, staring at her in fascination, as if she'd grown a third eye. Is it true? You're a child of Min... Min I mean, Athena. Yes, she said, suddenly feeling defensive. Why is that such a surprise? Octavian scoffed. If you're truly a child of the wisdom goddess... Enough, Raina snapped. Annabeth is what she says. She's here in peace. Besides, she gave Annabeth a look of grudging respect. Percy has spoken highly of you. The undertones in Raina's voice took Annabeth a moment to decipher. Percy looked down, suddenly interested in his cheeseburger. Annabeth's false f face felt hot. Oh, gods. Raina had tried to make a move on Percy. That explained the tinge of bitterness, maybe even envy in her words. Percy had turned her down for Annabeth. At that moment, Annabeth forgave her ridiculous boyfriend for everything she'd ever done. She wanted to throw her arms around him, but she commanded herself to stay cool. Uh, thanks, she told Rayner. At any rate, some of the prophecy is becoming clear. Foes bearing arms to the doors of death. That means Romans and Greeks. We have to combine forces to find those doors. Hazel, the girl with the cavalry helmet and the long curly hair, picked up something next to her plate. It looked like a large ruby. But before Annabeth could be sure, Hazel slipped it into the pocket of her denim shirt. My brother, Nico, went looking for the doors, she said. Wait, Annabeth said. Nico D'Angelo? He's your brother. Hazel nodded as if this was obvious. A dozen more questions crowded into Annabeth's head, but it was already spinning like Leo's pinwheel. She decided to let the matter go. Okay, you were saying? He disappeared. Hazel moistened her lips. I'm afraid. I'm not sure, but I think something's happened to him. We'll look for him. Percy promised. We have to find the doors of death anyway. Fernatos told us we'd find both answers in Rome, like the original Rome. That's on the way to Greece, right? Fernatos told you this. Annabeth tried to wrap her mind around that idea. The death god. She'd met many gods. She'd even been to the underworld, but Percy's story about freeing the incarnation of death itself really creeped her out. Percy took a bite of his burger. Now that death is free, monsters will disintegrate and return to Tartarus again, like they used to. But as long as the doors of death are open, they'll just keep coming back. Piper twisted the feather in her hair. Like water leaking through a dam, she suggested. Yeah, Percy smiled. We've got a dam hole. What? Piper asked. Nothing, he said. Inside joke. The point is, we'll have to find the doors and close them before we had head to Greece. It's the only way we'll stand a chance of defeating the giants and making sure they stay defeated. Raina plucked an apple from a passing fruit tray. She turned it in her fingers, studying the dark red surface. You propose an expedition to Greece in your warship. You do realise that the ancient lands and the Mare Nostrum are dangerous. Mary who? Leo asked. Mare Nostrum, Jason explained. Our sea. It's what the ancient Romans called the Mediterranean. Raina nodded. The territory that was once the Roman Empire is not only the birthplace of the gods, it's also the ancestral home of the monsters, titans and giants, and worse things. As dangerous as travel is for demigods here in America, there it would be ten times worse. You said Alaska would be bad, Percy reminded her. We survived that. Raina shook her head, her fingernails cut, little crescents into the apple as she turned it. Percy, travelling in the Mediterranean is a different level of danger altogether. It's been off limits to Roman demigods for centuries. No hero in his right mind would go there. Then, we're good, Leo grinned over the table of his, at the top of his pinwheel. Because we're all crazy, right? Besides, the Argo 2 is a top-of-the-line warship. She'll get us through. We'll have to hurry, Jason added. I don't know exactly what the giants are planning, but Gaia is growing more conscious all the time. She's invading dreams, appearing in weird places, summoning more and more powerful monsters. We have to stop the giants before they can wake up fully. Annabeth shuddered. She'd had her own share of nightmares lately. Seven half-bloods must answer the call, she said. It needs to be a mix from both our camps. Jason, Piper, Leo and me. That's four. And me, Percy said, along with Hazel and Frank. That's seven. What? Octavian shot to his feet. We're just supposed to accept that? Without a vote in the Senate? Without a proper debate? Without... Percy! Tyson the Cyclops bounded towards him, with Percy at Mrs O'Leary at his heels. On the hellhound's back sat the skinniest harpy Annabeth had ever seen, a sickly-looking girl with stringy red hair, a sackcloth dress and red feathered wings. 
Annabeth didn't know where the harpy had come from, but her heart warmed to see Tyson in his tattered flannel and denim with a backwards SPQR banner across his chest. She'd had some pretty bad experiences with Cyclops, but Tyson was a sweetheart. He was also Percy's half-brother, long story, which made him almost like family. Tyson stopped by their couch and wrung his meaty hands. His big brown eye was full of concern. Ella is scared, he said. No, 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 no more boats, the harpy muttered to herself, picking furiously at her feathers. Titanic, Lusitania, Pax, and boats are not for harpies. Leo squinted. He looked at Hazel, who was seated next to him. Did that chicken girl just compare my ship to the Titanic? She's not a chicken, Hazel averted her eyes, as if Leo made her nervous. Ella's a harpy. She's just a little high strung. Ella is pretty, Tyson said, and scared. We need to take her away, but she will not go on the ship. No ships, Ella repeated. She looked straight at Annabeth. Bad luck. There she is. Wisdom's daughter walks alone. Ella, Frank stood suddenly. Maybe it's not the best time. The mark of Athena burns through Rome, Ella continued, cupping her hands over her ears and raising her voice. Twins snuff out the angel's breath, who holds the key to endless death. Giant's bane stands gold and pale, won through pain from a woven jail. The effect was like someone dropping a flash grenade on the table. Everyone stared at the harpy. No one spoke. Annabeth's heart was pounding. The mark of Athena. She resisted the urge to check her pocket, but she could feel the silver coin growing warmer, the cursed gift from her mother. Follow the mark of Athena. Avenge me. Around them, the sounds of the feast continued, but muted and distant, as if their little cluster of couches had slipped into a quieter dimension. Percy was the first to recover. He stood and took Tyson's arm. I know, he said with feigned enthusiasm. How about you take Ella to get some fresh air? You and Mrs O'Leary. Hold on. Octavian gripped one of his teddy bears, strangling it with shaking hands, his eyes fixed on Ella. What was that she said? It sounded like... Ella reads a lot, Frank blurted out. We found her at a library. Yes, Hazel said. Probably just something she read in a book. Books, Ella muttered helpfully. Ella likes books. Now that she'd said her piece, the harpy seemed more relaxed. She sat cross-legged on Mrs O'Leary's back, preening her wings. Annabeth gave Percy a curious glance. Obviously, he and Frank and Hazel were hiding something. Just as obviously, Ella had recited a prophecy, a prophecy that concerned her. Percy's expression said, help. That was a prophecy, Octavian insisted. It sounded like a prophecy. No one answered. Annabeth wasn't exactly sure what was going on, but she understood that Percy was on the verge of big trouble. She forced a laugh. <laughs> really, Octavian, maybe harpies are different here. On the Roman side, ours have just enough intelligence to clean cabins and cook lunches. Do yours usually foretell the future? Do you consult them for your auguries? Her words had the intended effect. The Roman officers laughed nervously. Some sized up Ella and then looked at Octavian and snorted. The idea of a chicken lady issuing prophecies was apparently just as ridiculous to Romans as it was to Greeks. I, uh, Octavian dropped his teddy bear. No, but, uh, she's just spouting lines from some book, Annabeth said, like Hazel suggested. Besides, we already have a real prophecy to worry about. She turned to Tyson. Percy's right. Why don't you take Ella and Mrs O'Leary and shadow travel somewhere for a while? Is Ella okay with that? Large dogs are good, Ella said. Old Yeller, 1957, screenplay by Fred Gibson and William Tunberg. Annabeth wasn't sure how to take that answer, but Percy smiled like the problem was solved. Great, Percy said. We'll uh, Iris message you guys when we're done and catch up with you later. The Romans looked at Raina, waiting for her ruling. Annabeth held her breath. Raina had an excellent poker face. She studied Ella, but Annabeth couldn't guess what she was thinking. Fine, the praetor said at last. Go. Yay! Tyson went around the couches and gave everyone a big hug, even Octavian, who didn't look happy about it. Then he climbed on Mrs O'Leary's back with Ella, and the hellhound bounded out of the forum. They dived straight into a shadow on the Senate House wall and disappeared. Well, Raina set down her uneaten apple. Octavian is right about one thing. We must gain the Senate's approval before we let any of our legionnaires go on a quest, especially one as dangerous as you're suggesting. This whole thing smells of treachery, Octavian grumbled. That Tareem is not a ship of peace. Come, come aboard, man, Leo offered. I'll give you a tour. You can steer the boat, and if you're really good, I'll give you a little paper captain's hat to wear. Octavian's nostrils flared. How dare you? It's a good idea, Raina said. Octavian, go with him. See the ship. We'll convene a Senate meeting in one hour. But Octavian stopped. 
Apparently he could tell from Raylan's expression that further arguing would not be good for his health. Fine. Leo got up. He turned to Annabeth and his smile changed. It happened so quickly, Annabeth thought she'd imagined it. But just for a moment, someone else seemed to be standing in Leo's place, smiling coldly with a cruel light in his eyes. Then Annabeth blinked, and Leo was just regular old Leo again, with his usual impish grin. Back soon, he promised. This is going to be epic. A horrible chill settled over her. As Leo and Octavian headed for the rope ladder, she thought about calling them back. But how could she explain that? Tell everyone she was going crazy, seeing things and feeling cold. The wind spirits began clearing the plates. Uh, Raina, Jason said, if you don't mind, I'd like to show Piper around before the Senate meeting. She's never seen New Rome. Raina's expression hardened. Annabeth wondered how Jason could be so dense. Was it possible he really didn't understand how much Raina liked him? It was obvious enough to Annabeth. Asking to show his new girlfriend around Raina's city was rubbing salt in a wound. Of course, Raina said coldly. Percy took Annabeth's hand. Yeah, me too. I'd like to show Annabeth. No, Raina snapped. Percy knitted his eyebrows. Sorry? I'd like a few words with Annabeth, Raina said. Alone, if you don't mind, my fellow Praetor. Her tone made it clear she wasn't really asking permission. The chill spread down Annabeth's back. She wondered what Raina was up to. Maybe the Praetor didn't like the idea of two guys who had rejected her giving their girlfriends tours of her city. Or maybe there was something she wanted to say in private. Either way, Annabeth was reluctant to be alone and unarmed with the Roman leader. Come, daughter of Athena. Raina rose from her couch. Walk with me. Chapter 4. Annabeth. Annabeth wanted to hate New Rome, but as an aspiring architect, she couldn't help admiring the terrace gardens, the fountains and temples, the winding cobblestone streets and gleaming white villas. After the Titan War last summer, she got her dream job of de redesigning the palaces of Mount Olympus. Now, walking through this miniature city, she kept thinking, I should have made a dome like that. I love the way those columns lead into that courtyard. Whoever designed New Rome had clearly poured a lot of time and love into the project. We have the best architects and builders in the world, Raina said, as if reading her thoughts. Rome always did, in the ancient times. Many demigods stay on to live here after their time in the Legion. They go to our university. They settle down to raise families. Percy seemed interested in this fact. Annabeth wondered what that meant. She must have scowled more fiercely than she realised because Raina laughed. <laughs> You're a warrior, all right, the Praetor said. You've got fire in your eyes. Sorry. Annabeth tried to tone down the glare. Don't be. I'm the daughter of Bologna. Roman goddess of war? Raina nodded. She turned and whistled like she was hailing a cab. A moment later, two metal dogs raced towards them, automaton greyhounds, one silver and one gold. They brushed against Raina's legs and regarded Annabeth with glistening ruby eyes. My pets, Raina explained. Aurum and Argentum. You don't mind if they walk with us. Again, Annabeth got the feeling it wasn't really a request. She noted that the greyhounds had teeth like steel arrowheads. Maybe weapons weren't allowed inside the city, but Raina's pets could still tear Annabeth to pieces if they chose. Raina led her to an outdoor cafe, where the waiter clearly knew her. He smiled and handed her a takeaway cup, then offered one to Annabeth. Would you like some? Raina asked. They make wonderful hot chocolate. Not really a Roman drink. But chocolate is universal, Annabeth said. Exactly. It was a warm June afternoon, but Annabeth accepted the cup with thanks. The two of them walked on, Raina's gold and silver dogs roaming nearby. In our camp, Raina said, Athena is Minerva. Are you familiar with how her Roman form is different? Annabeth hadn't really considered it before. She remembered the way Terminus had called Athena that goddess, as if she were scandalous. Octavian had acted like Annabeth's very existence was an insult. I take it Minerva isn't uh, quite as respected here? Raina blew steam from her cup. We respect Minerva. She's the goddess of crafts and wisdom, but she isn't really a goddess of war, not for Romans. She's also a maiden goddess, like Diana, the one you call Artemis. You won't find any children of Minerva here. The idea that Minerva would have children, frankly, it's a little shocking to us. Oh, Annabel felt her face flush. She didn't want to get into the details of Athena's children, how they were born straight from the mind of the goddess, just as Athena herself had sprung from the head of Zeus. Talking about that always made Annabeth feel self-conscious, like she was some sort of freak. People usually asked her whether or not she had a belly button, since she had been born magically. Of course she had a belly button. She couldn't explain how. She didn't really want to know. I understand that you Greeks don't see things the same way, Raina continued. But Romans take vows of maidenhood very seriously. The Vestal Virgins, for instance, if they broke their vows and fell in love with anyone, they would be buried alive. 
So the idea that a maiden goddess would have children. Got it. Annabeth's hot chocolate suddenly tasted like dust. No wonder the Romans have been giving her strange looks. I'm not supposed to exist. And even if your camp had children of Minerva, they wouldn't be like you, Rainer said. They might be craftsmen, artists, maybe advisors, but not warriors, not leaders of dangerous quests. Annabeth started to object that she wasn't the leader of the quest. Not officially, but she wondered if her friends on the Argo too would agree. The past few days, they had been looking to her for orders. Even Jason, who could have pulled rank as the son of Jupiter, and Coach Hedge, who didn't take orders from anyone. There's more. Raina snapped her fingers, and her golden dog, Aram, trotted over. The praetor stroked his ears. The harpy, Ella. It was a prophecy, she spoke. We both know that, don't we? Annabeth swallowed. Something about Aram's ruby eyes made her uneasy. She had heard that dogs could smell fear, even detect changes in a human's breathing and heartbeat. She didn't know if that applied to magical metal dogs, but she decided it would be better to tell the truth. It sounded like a prophecy, she admitted, but I've never met Ella before today, and I've never heard those lines exactly. I have, Raina murmured, at least some of them. A few yards away, the silver dog barked. A group of children spilled out of a nearby alleyway and gathered around Argentum, petting the dog and laughing, unfazed by its razor-sharp teeth. We should move on, Rayner said. They wound their way up the hill. The greyhounds followed, leaving the children behind. Annabeth kept glancing at Rayner's face. A vague memory started tugging at her, the way Rayner brushed her hair behind her ear, the silver ring she wore with a torch and sword design. We've met before, Annabeth ventured. You were younger, I think. Rayner gave her a dry smile. Very good. Percy didn't remember me. Of course, you spoke mostly with my older sister, Hilla, who is now Queen of the Amazons. She left just this morning before you arrived. At any rate, when we last met, I was a mere handmaiden in the house of Circe. Circe? Annabeth remembered her trip to the island of the sorceress. She'd been thirteen. Percy and she had washed ashore from the Sea of Monsters. Hilla had welcomed them. She had helped Annabeth get cleaned up and given her a beautiful new dress and a complete makeover. Then Circe had made her sales pitch. If Annabeth stayed on the island, she could have magical training and incredible power. Annabeth had been tempted, maybe just a little, until she realised the place was a trap, and Percy had been turned into a rodent. That last part seemed funny afterwards, but at the time it had been terrifying. As for Raina, she'd been one of the servants who had combed Annabeth's hair. You, Annabeth said in amazement, and Hillary's is queen of the Amazons. How did you two? Long story, Raina said, but I remember you well. You were brave. I'd never seen anyone refuse Circe's hospitality, much less outwit her. It's no wonder Percy cares for you. Her voice was wistful. Annabeth thought it might be safer not to respond. They reached the top of the hill where a terrace overlooked the entire valley. This is my favourite spot, Rayner said, the Garden of Bacchus. Grapevine trellis trellises made a canopy overhead. Bees buzzed through honeysuckle and jasmine, which filled the afternoon air with dizzying mix of perfumes. In the middle of the terrace stood a statue of Bacchus, in a sort of ballet position, wearing nothing but a loincloth, his cheeks puffed out and his lips pursed, spouting water into a fountain. Despite her worries, Annabeth almost laughed. She knew the god in his Greek form, Dionysus, or Mr. D as they called him back at Camp Half-Blood, seeing their cranky old camp director immortalised in stone, wearing a nappy and spewing water from his mouth, made her feel a little better. Rainer stopped at the edge of the terrace. The view was worth the climb. The whole city spread out below them like a 3D mosaic. To the south, beyond the lake, a cluster of temples perched on a hill. To the north, an aqueduct marched towards the Berkeley Hills. Work crews were repairing a broken section, probably damaged in the recent battle. I wanted to hear it from you, Rayner said. Annabeth turned. Hear what from me? The truth, Rayner said. Convince me that I'm not making a mistake by trusting you. Tell me about yourself. Tell me about Camp Halfblood. Your friend Piper has sorcery in her words. I spent enough time with Circe to know charm speak when I hear it. I can't trust what she says. And Jason, well, he has changed. He seems distant, no longer quite Roman. The hurt in her voice was as sharp as broken glass. Annabeth wondered if she had sounded that way all the months she'd spent searching for Percy. At least she'd found her boyfriend. Raina had no one. She was responsible for running an entire camp all by herself. Annabeth could sense that Raina wanted Jason to love her, but he had disappeared only to come back with a new girlfriend. Meanwhile, Percy had risen to Praetor, but he had rebuffed Rayner too. Now Annabeth had come to take him away. Rayner would be left alone again, shouldering a job meant for two people. When Annabeth had arrived at Camp Jupiter, she'd been prepared to negotiate with Rayner, or even fight her if needed. She hadn't been prepared to feel sorry for her. She kept that feeling hidden. Rayner didn't strike her as someone who would appreciate pity. Instead, she told Rayner about her own life. 
She talked about her dad and stepmom and her two stepbrothers in San Francisco and how she had felt like an outsider in her own family. She talked about how she had run away when she was only seven, finding her friends Luke and Thalia and making her way to Camp Halfblood on Long Island. She described the camp and her years growing up there. She talked about meeting Percy and the adventures they'd had together. Raina was a good listener. Annabeth was tempted to tell her about more recent problems, her fight with her mum, the gift of the silver coin and the nightmares she'd been having, about an old fear so paralysing she'd almost decided that she couldn't go on this quest, but she couldn't bring herself to open up quite that much. When Annabeth was done talking, Raina gazed over, over at New Rome. Her metal greyhound sniffed around the garden, snapping at bees in the honeysuckle. Finally, Raina pointed to the cluster of temples on the distant hill. The small red building, she said, there on the northern side. The, that's the temple of my mother, Bologna. Raina started and turned towards Annabeth. Unlike your mother, Bologna has no Greek equivalent. She is fully, truly Roman. She's the goddess of protecting the homeland. Annabeth said nothing. She knew very little about the Roman goddess. She wished she had studied up, but Latin never came as easily to her as Greek. Down below, the hull of the Argo II gleamed as it floated over the forum, like some massive bronze party balloon. When the Romans go to war, Raina continued, we first visit the Temple of Bologna. Inside is a symbolic patch of ground that represents enemy soil. We throw a spear into that ground, indicating that we are now at war. You see, Romans have always believed that offence is the best defence. In ancient times, whenever our ancestors felt threatened by their neighbours, they would invade to protect themselves. They conquered everyone around them, Annabeth said. Carthage, the Gauls, and the Greeks. Raina let the comment hang. My point, Annabeth, is that it isn't Rome's nature to cooperate with other powers. Every time Greek and Roman demigods have met, we fought. Conflicts between our two sides have started some of the most horrible wars in human history, especially civil wars. It doesn't have to be that way, Annabeth said. We've got to work together or Gaia will destroy us both. I agree, Raina said. But is cooperation possible? What if Juno's plan is flawed? Even goddesses can make mistakes. Annabeth waited for Raina to get stuck, struck by lightning or turned into a peacock. Nothing happened. Unfortunately, Annabeth shared Raina's doubts. Hera did make mistakes. Annabeth had had nothing but trouble from that overbearing goddess, and she'd never forgiven Hera for taking Percy away, even if it was for a noble cause. I don't trust the goddess, Annabeth admitted, but I do trust my friends. This isn't a trick, Raina. We can work together. Raina finished her cup of chocolate. She set the cup on the terrace railing and gazed over the valley, as if imagining battle lines. I believe you mean it, she said. But if you go to the ancient lands, especially Rome itself, there is something you should know about your mother. Annabeth's shoulders tensed. My, my mother. When I lived on Circe's Island, Raina said, we had many visitors. Once, perhaps a year before you and Percy arrived, a young man washed ashore. He was half mad from thirst and heat. He'd been drifting at sea for days. His words didn't make much sense, but he said he was a son of Athena. Raina paused as if waiting for a reaction. Annabeth had no idea who the boy might have been. She wasn't aware of any other Athena kids who'd gone on a quest in the Sea of Monsters, but still she felt a sense of dread. The light filtering through the grapevines made shadows writhe across the ground like a swarm of bugs. What happened to this demigod? she asked. Raina waved her hand as if the question was trivial. Circe turned him into a guinea pig, of course. He made quite a crazy little rodent. But before that, he kept raving about his failed quest. He claimed that he'd gone to Rome following the Mark of Athena. Annabeth grabbed the railing to keep her balance. Yes, Raina said, seeing her discomfort. He kept muttering about Wisdom's child, the Mark of Athena, and the giant's bane standing pale and gold. The same lines Ella was just reciting. But you say that you've never heard them before today? Not, not the way Ella said them. Annabeth's voice was weak. She wasn't lying. She'd never heard the prophecy, but her mother had charged her with the following, with following the mark of Athena. And as she thought about the coin in her pocket, a horrible suspicion began taking root in her mind. She remembered her mother's scathing words. She thought about the strange nightmares she'd been having lately. Did this demigod, did he explain his quest? Raina shook her head. At the time, I had no idea what he was talking about. Much later, when I became praetor of Camp Jupiter, I began to suspect. Suspect what? There is an old legend that the praetors of Camp Jupiter have passed down through the centuries. If it's true, it may explain why our two groups of demigods have never been able to work together. It may be the cause of our animosity. Until the old score is finally settled, so the legend goes, Romans and Greeks will never be at peace, and the legend centres on Athena. A shrill sound pierced the air. 
Light flashed in the corner of Annabeth's eye. She turned in time to see an explosion blast a new crater in the forum. A burning couch tumbled through the air. Demigods scattered in panic. Giants? Annabeth reached for her dagger, which of course wasn't there. I thought their army was defeated. It isn't the giants. Raina's eyes seethed with rage. You betrayed our trust. What? No! As soon as she said it, the Argo too launched a second volley. Its port ballista fired a massive spear, reefed in Greek fire, which sailed straight through the broken dome of the Senate House and exploded inside, lighting up the building like a jack-o'-lantern. If anyone had been in there. Gods, no! A wave of nausea almost made Annabeth's knees buckle. Rainer, it isn't possible. We'd never do this. The metal dogs ran to their mistress's side. They snarled at Annabeth, but paced uncertainly, as if reluctant to attack. You're telling the truth, Rainer judged. Perhaps... You were not aware of this treachery, but someone must pay. Down in the forum, chaos was spreading. Crowds were pushing and shoving. Fist fights were breaking out. Bloodshed, Raina said. We have to stop it. Annabeth had a horrible feeling this might be the last time Raina and she ever acted in agreement, but together they ran down the hill. If weapons had been allowed in the city, Annabeth's friends would have already been dead. The Roman demigods in the forum had coalesced into an angry mob. Some threw plates, food and rocks at the Argo too, which was pointless, as most of the stuff fell back into the crowd. Several dozen Romans had surrounded Piper and Jason, who were trying to calm them down without much luck. Piper's charm speak was useless against so many screaming, angry demigods. Jason's forehead was bleeding. His purple cloak had been ripped to shreds. He kept pleading, I'm on your side! But his orange camp half-blood t-shirt didn't help matters. Nor did the warship overhead, firing flaming spears into New Rome. One landed nearby and blasted a toga shop to rubble. Pluto's pauldrons, Rainer cursed. Look! Armed legionnaires were hurrying towards the forum. Two artillery crews had set up catapults just outside the Pomerian line and were preparing to fire at the Argo too. They'll just make things worse, Annabeth said. I hate my job, Rainer growled. She rushed off towards the legionnaires, her dogs at her side. Percy, Annabeth thought, scanning the forum desperately. Where are you? Two Romans tried to grab her. She ducked past them, plunging into the crowd. As if the angry Romans burning couches and exploding buildings weren't confusing enough, hundreds of purple ghosts drifted through the forum, passing straight through the demigods' bodies and wailing incoherently. The fauns had also taken advantage of the chaos. They swarmed the dining tables, grabbing food, plates and cups. One trotted by Annabeth, with his arms full of tacos and an entire pineapple between his teeth. A statue of Terminus exploded into being, right in front of Annabeth. He yelled at her in Latin, no doubt calling her a liar and a rule breaker, but she pushed the statue over and kept running. Finally, she spotted Percy. He and his friends, Hazel and Frank, were standing in the middle of a fountain as Percy repelled the angry Romans with blasts of water. Percy's toga was in tatters, but he looked unhurt. Annabeth called to him as another explosion rocked the forum. This time, the flash of light was directly overhead. One of the Roman catapults had fired, and the Argo too groaned and tilted sideways, flames bubbling over its bronze-plated hull. Annabeth noticed a figure clinging desperately to the rope ladder, trying to climb down. It was Octavian, his robes steaming and his face black with soot. Over by the fountain, Percy blasted the Roman mob with more water. Annabeth ran towards him, ducking a Roman fist and flying plate of sandwiches. Annabeth, Percy called. What? I don't know, she yelled. I'll tell you what, cried a voice from above. Octavian had reached the bottom of the ladder. The Greeks have fired on us. Your boy Leo has trained his weapons on Rome. Annabeth's chest filled with liquid hydrogen. She felt like she might shatter into a million frozen pieces. You're lying, she said. Leo would never... I was just there, Octavian shrieked. I saw it with my own eyes. The Argo too returned fire. Legionnaires in the field scattered as one of their catapults was blasted to splinters. You see? Octavian screamed. Romans, kill the invaders! Annabeth growled in frustration. There was no time for anyone to figure out the truth. The crew from Camp Half-Blood was outnumbered a hundred to one, and even if Octavian had managed to stage some sort of trick, which she thought likely, they'd never be able to convince the Romans before they were overrun and killed. We have to leave, she told Percy. Now. He nodded grimly. Hazel, Frank, you've got to make a choice. Are you coming? Hazel looked terrified, but she donned her cavalry helmet. Of course we are, but you'll never make it to the ship unless we buy you some time. How? Annabeth asked. Hazel whistled. Instantly, a blur of beige shot across the forum. A majestic horse materialised next to the fountain. He reared, whinnying and scattering the mob. Hazel climbed on his back like she'd been born to ride. Strapped to the horse's saddle was a Roman cavalry sword. 
Hazel unsheathed her golden blade. Send me an iris message when you're safely away and we'll rendezvous, she said. Arion, ride. The horse zipped through the crowd with incredible speed, pushing back Romans and causing mass panic. Annabeth felt, Annabeth felt a glimmer of hope. Maybe they could make it out of here alive. Then, from halfway across the forum, she heard Jason shouting. Romans, he cried. Please. He and Piper were being pelted with plates and stones. Jason tried to shield, shield Piper, but a brick caught him above the eye. He crumpled and the crowd surged forward. Get back. Piper screamed. Her charm speak rolled over the mob, making them hesitate. But Annabeth knew the effect wouldn't last. She and Percy couldn't possibly reach in time to help. Frank, Percy said. It's up to you. Can you help them? Annabeth didn't understand how Frank could do that all by himself, but he swallowed nervously. Oh, gods, he murmured. Okay, sure. Just get up the ropes now. Percy and Annabeth lunged for the ladder. Octavian was still clinging to the bottom, but Percy yanked him off and threw him into the mob. They began to climb as armed legionnaires flooded into the forum. Arrows whistled past Annabeth's head. An explosion almost knocked her off the ladder. Halfway up, she heard a roar below and glanced down. Romans screamed and scattered as a full-sized dragon charged through the forum, a beast even scarier than the bronze dragon figurehead on the Argo II. It had rough grey skin like a Komodo lizard's and leathery bat wings. Arrows and rocks bounced harmlessly off its side as it lumbered towards Piper and Jason, grabbed them with its front claws and vaulted into the air. Is that? Annabeth couldn't even put the fort into words. Frank, Percy confirmed, a few feet above her. He has a, a few special talents. Understatement, Annabeth muttered. Keep climbing. Without the dragon and Hazel's horse to distract the archers, they never would have made it up the ladder. But finally they climbed past a row of broken aerial oars and into the deck. The rigging was on fire, the foresail was ripped down the middle, and the ship listed badly to starboard. There was no sign of Coach Hedge, but Leo stood amidships, calmly reloading the ballastay. Annabeth's gut twisted with horror. Leo, she screamed, what are you doing? Destroy them. He faced Annabeth. His eyes were glazed, his movements were like a robot's. Destroy them all. He turned back to the ballastay, but Percy tackled him. Leo's head hit the deck hard and his eyes rolled up so that only the whites showed. The grey dragon soared into view. It circled the ship once and landed at the bow, depositing Jason and Piper, who both collapsed. Go, Percy yelled. Get us out of here. With a shock, Annabeth realised he was talking to her. She ran for the helm. She made the mistake of glancing over the rail and saw armed legionnaires closing ranks in the forum, preparing flaming arrows. Hazel spurred Arian, and they raced out of the city, city with a mob chasing after them. More catapults were being wheeled into range. All along the Pomerian line, the statues of Terminus were glowing purple, as if building up energy for some kind of attack. Annabeth looked over the controls. She cursed Leo for making them so complicated. No time for fancy manoeuvres, but she did know one basic command. Up. She grabbed the aviation throttle and yanked it straight back. The ship groaned, the bow tilted up at a horrifying angle, the mooring line snapped, and the Argo too shot into the clouds. Chapter 5. Leo. Leo wished he could invent a time machine. He'd go back two hours and undo what had happened. Either that or he could invent a slap Leo in the face machine to punish himself, though he doubted it would hurt as badly as the look Annabeth was giving him. One more time, she said. Exactly what happened? Leo slumped against the mast, his head still throbbed from hitting the deck. All around him his beautiful new ship was in shambles, the aft crossbows were piles of kindling, the foresail was tattered, the satellite array that powered the onboard internet and TV was blown to bits, which had really made Coach Hedge mad. Their bronze dragon figurehead Festus was coughing up smoke like he had a hairball, and Leo could tell from the groaning sounds on the port side that some of the aerial oars had been knocked out of alignment or broken off completely which explained why the ship was listing and shuddering as it flew, the engine wheezing like an asthmatic steam train. He choked back a sob. I don't know. It's fuzzy. Too many people were looking at him. Annabeth. Leo hated to make her angry. That girl scared him. Coach Hedge with his furry goat legs, his orange polo shirt and his baseball bat. Did he have to carry that everywhere? And the newcomer, Frank. Leo wasn't sure what to make of Frank. He looked like a baby sumo wrestler, though Leo wasn't stupid enough to say that out loud. Leo's memory was hazy, but while he'd been half-conscious, he was pretty sure he'd seen a dragon land on the ship, a dragon that had turned into Frank. Annabeth crossed her arms. You mean, you don't remember? I, uh... Leo felt as if he was trying to swallow a marble. I remember, but it's like I was watching myself do things. I couldn't control it. 
Coach Hedge tapped his bat against the deck. In his gym clothes, with his cap pulled over his horns, he looked just like he used to at the Wilderness School, where he'd spent a year undercover as Jason Piper and Leo's PE teacher. The way he, the old satyr was glowering, Leo almost wondered if the coach was going to order him to do push-ups. Look, kid, Hedge said, you blew up some stuff. You attacked some Romans. Awesome. Excellent. But did you have to knock out the satellite channels? I was right at the middle of watching a cage match. Coach, Annabeth said, why don't you make sure all the fires are out? But I already did that. Do it again. The satyr trudged off, muttering under his breath. Even Hedge wasn't crazy enough to defy Annabeth. She knelt next to Leo. Her grey eyes were as steely as ball bearings. Her blonde hair fell loose around her shoulders, but Leo didn't find that attractive. He had no idea where the stereotype of dumb, giggly blondes came from. Ever since he'd met Annabeth at the Grand Canyon last winter, when she'd marched towards him with that give me Percy Jackson or I'll kill you expression, Leo thought of blondes as much too smart and much too dangerous. Leo, she said calmly, did Octavian trick you somehow? Did he frame you or... No. Leo could have lied and blamed that stupid Roman, but he didn't want to make a bad situation worse. The guy was a jerk, but he didn't fire on the camp. I did. The new kid, Frank, scowled. On purpose? No. Leo squeezed his eyes shut. Well, yes, I mean, I didn't want to, but at the same time I felt like I wanted to. Something was making me do it. There was this cold feeling inside me. A cold feeling? Annabeth's tone changed. She sounded almost scared. Yeah, Leo said. Why? From below decks, Percy called up. Annabeth, we need you. Oh, gods, Leo thought. Please let Jason be okay. As soon as they were on board, Piper had taken Jason below. The cut on his head had looked pretty bad. Leo had known Jason longer than anyone at Camp Half-Blood. They were best friends. If Jason didn't make it, he'll be fine. Annabeth's expression softened. Frank, I'll be back. Just watch Leo, please. Frank nodded. If it was possible for Leo to feel worse, he did. Annabeth now trusted a Roman demigod she'd known for like three seconds more than she trusted Leo. Once she was gone, Leo and Frank stared at each other. The big dude looked pretty odd in his bedsheet toga with his grey pullover hoodie and jeans and a bow and quiver from the ship, ship's armoury slung over his shoulder. Leo remembered the time he had met the hunters of Artemis, a bunch of cute live girls in silvery clothes, all armed with bows. He imagined Frank frolicking along with them. The idea was so ridiculous it almost made him feel better. So, Frank said, your name isn't Sammy. Leo scowled. What kind of question is that? Nothing, Frank said quickly. I just... nothing. About the firing on the camp. Octavian could be behind it, like magically or something. He didn't want the Romans getting along with you guys. Leo wanted to believe that. He was grateful to this kid for not hating him, but he knew it hadn't been Octavian. Leo had walked to a ballista and started firing. Part of him had known it was wrong. He'd asked himself, what the heck am I doing? But he'd done it anyway. Maybe he was going crazy. The stress of all those months working on the Argo 2 might have finally made him crack. But he couldn't think about that. He needed to do something productive. His hands needed to be busy. Look, he said, I should talk to Festus and get a damage report. You mind? Frank helped him up. Who is Festus? My friend, Leo said. His name isn't Sammy either, in case you're wondering. Come on, I'll introduce you. Fortunately, the bronze dragon wasn't damaged. Well, aside from the fact that last winter he'd lost everything except his head, but Leo didn't count that. When they reached the bow of the ship, the figurehead turned 180 degrees to look at them. Frank yelped and backed away. It's alive, he said. Leo would have laughed if he hadn't felt so bad. Yeah, Frank, this is Festus. He used to be a full bronze dragon, but we had an accident. You have a lot of accidents, Frank noted. Well, some of us can't turn into dragons, so we have to build our own. Leo arched his eyebrows at Frank. Anyway, I revived him as a figurehead. He's kind of the ship's main interface now. How are things looking, Festus? Festus snorted smoke and made a series of squeaking whirring sounds. Over the last few months, Leo had learned to interpret this machine language. Other demigods could understand Latin and Greek. Leo could speak creak and squeak. Ah, uh, Leo said, could be worse, but the hull is compromised in several places. The poor aerial oars have to be fixed before we can go full speed again. We'll need some repair materials. Celestial bronze, tar, lime. What do you need limes for? Dude, lime, calcium carbonate, used in cement and a bunch of other... Ah, uh, never mind. The point is this ship isn't going far unless we can fix it. Festus made another click-creak noise that Leo didn't recognise. It sounded like, I zoo. Oh, Hazel, he deciphered. That's the girl with the curly hair, right? Frank gulped. Is she okay? Yeah, she's fine, Leo said. According to Festus, her horse is racing along below. She's following us. We've got to land then, Frank said. Leo studied him. She's your girlfriend. Frank chewed his lip. Yes. You don't sound sure. 
Yes, yes, definitely, I'm sure. Leo raised his hands. Okay, fine. The problem is, we can only manage one landing. The way the hull and the oars are, we won't be able to lift off again until we repair, so we'll have to make sure we land somewhere with all the right supplies. Frank scratched his head. Where do you get celestial bronze? You can't just stock up at a home depot. Festus, do a scam. He can scam for magic bronze? Frank marvelled. Is there anything he can't do? Leo thought. You just should have seen him when he had a body. But he didn't say that. It was too painful remembering the way Festus used to be. Leo peered over the ship's bow. The central California valley was passing below. Leo didn't hold out much hope that they could find what they needed all in one place. But they had to try. Leo also wanted to put as much distance as possible between himself and New Rome. The Argo too could, co could cover vast distances pretty quickly, thanks to its magical engine, but Leo figured the Romans had magic travel methods of their own. Behind him, the stairs creaked. Percy and Annabeth climbed up, their faces grim. Leo's heart stumbled. His Jason, he's resting, Annabeth said. Piper's keeping an eye on him, but he should be fine. Percy gave him a hard look. Annabeth says you did fire that ballista. Man, I, uh, I don't understand how it happened. I'm so sorry. Sorry? Percy growled. Annabeth put a hand on her boyfriend's chest. We'll figure it out later. Right now, we have to regroup and make a plan. What's the situation with the ship? Leo's legs trembled. The way Percy had looked at him made him feel the same as when Jason summoned lightning. Leo's skin tingled and every instinct in his body screamed duck. He told Annabeth about the damage and the supplies they needed. At least he felt better talking about something fixable. He was bemoaning the shortage of celestial bronze when Festus began to whir and squeak. Perfect, Leo sighed with relief. What's perfect, Annabeth said. I could use some perfect about now. Leo managed to smile. Everything we need in one place. Frank, why don't you turn into a bird or something? Fly down and tell your girlfriend to meet us at the Great Salt Lake in Utah. Once they got there, it wasn't a pretty landing. With the oars damaged and the foresail torn, Leo could barely manage a controlled descent. The others strapped themselves in below, except for Coach Hedge, who insisted on clinging to the forward rail, yelling, Yeah, bring it on, Lake! Leo stood astern, alone at the helm, and aimed as best he could. Festus creaked and whirred warning signals, which were relayed through the intercom to the quarterdeck. I know, I know, Leo said, gritting his teeth. He didn't have much time to take in the scenery. To the southeast, a city was nestled in the foothills of a mountain range, blue and purple in the afternoon shadows. A flat desert landscape spread to the south. Directly beneath them, the great salt lake glittered like aluminium foil. The shoreline etched with white salt marshes that reminded Leo of aerial photos of Mars. Hang on, coach, he shouted. This is going to hurt. I was born for hurt. Woom. A swell of salt water washed over the bow, dousing Coach Hedge. The Argo too listed dangerously to starboard, then righted itself and rocked on the surface of the lake. Machinery hummed as the aerial blades that were still working changed to nautical form. Three banks of robotic oars dipped into the water and began moving them forward. Good job, Festus, Leo said. Take us towards the south shore. Yeah, Coach Hedge pumped his fists in the air. He was drenched from his horns to his hooves, but grinning like a crazy goat. Do it again! Uh... Maybe later, Leo said. Just stay above deck, okay? You can keep watch in case, you know, the lake decides to attack us or something. On it, Hedge promised. Leo rang the all-clear bell and headed for the stairs. Before he got there, a loud clump, clump, clump shook the hull. A tan stallion appeared on deck with Hazel Levesque on his back. How? Leo's question died in his throat. We're in the middle of a lake. Can that thing fly? The horse whinnied angrily. Arian can't fly, Hazel said, but he can run across just about anything. Water, vertical surfaces, small mountains, none of that bothers him. Oh. Hazel was looking at him strangely, the way she had during the feast in the forum, like she was searching for something in his face. He was tempted to ask if they had met before, but he was sure they hadn't. He would remember a pretty girl paying such close attention to him. That didn't happen a lot. She's Frank's girlfriend, he reminded himself. Frank was still below, but Leo almost wished the big guy would come up the stairs. The way Hazel was studying Leo made him feel uneasy and self-conscious. Coach Hedge crept forward with his baseball bat, eyeing the magic horse suspiciously. Valdez, does this count as an invasion? No, Leo said. Um, Hazel, you better come with me. I built a stable below decks. If Arian wants to... He's more of a free spirit, Hazel slipped out of the saddle. He'll graze around the lake until I call him, but I want to see the ship. Lead the way. The Argo too was designed like an ancient terrain, only twice as big. The first deck had one central corridor with crew cabins on either side. On a normal terrain, 
most of the space would have been taken up with three rows of benches for a few hundred sweaty guys to do the manual labour. But Leo's oars were automated and retractable, so they took up very little room inside the hull. The ship's power came from the engine room on the second and lowest deck, which also housed sick bay, storage and the stables. Leo led the way down the hall. He built the ship with eight cabins, seven for the demigods of the prophecy and a room for Coach Hedge. Seriously, Chiron considered him a responsible adult chaperone? At the stern was a large mess hall lounge, which was where Leo headed. On the way, they passed Jason's room. The door was open. Piper sat at the side of his berth, holding Jason's hand while he snored with an ice pack on his head. Piper glanced at Leo. She held a finger to her lips for quiet, but she didn't look angry. That was something. Leo tried to force down his guilt and they kept walking. When they reached the mess hall, they found the others, Percy, Annabeth and Frank, sitting dejectedly around the dining table. Leo had made the lounge as nice as possible since he figured they'd be spending a lot of time there. The cupboard was lined with magic cups and plates from Camp Halfblood, which could fill up and with whatever food or drink you wanted on command. There was also a magical ice chest with canned drinks perfect for picnics ashore. The chairs were cushy recliners with thousand finger massage, built-in headphones and sword and drink holders for all your demigod kicking back needs. There were no windows, but the walls were enchanted to show real-time footage from Camp Halfblood, the beach, the forest, the strawberry fields, although now Leo was wondering if this made people homesick rather than happy. Percy was staring longingly at a sunset view of Halfblood Hill where the golden fleece glittered in the branches of the tall pine tree. So we've landed, Percy said. What now? Frank plucked on his bowstring. Figure out the prophecy? I mean, that was a prophecy, Ella spoke right, from the Sibylline books. The what? Leo asked. Frank explained how their harpy friend was freakishly good at memorising books. At some point in the past, she'd inhaled a collection of ancient prophecies that had supposedly been destroyed around the fall of Rome. That's why you didn't tell the Romans, Leo guessed. You didn't want them to get hold of her. Percy kept staring at the image of Half-Blood Hill. Ella's sensitive. She was a captive when we found her. I just didn't want... He made a fist. It doesn't matter now. I sent Tyson an Iris message, told him to take Ella to Camp Halfblood. They'll be safe there. Leo doubted that any of them would be safe. Now that he had stirred up a camp of angry Romans on top of the problems they had already had with Gaia and the Giants, but he kept quiet. Annabeth laced her fingers. Let me think about the prophecy. But right now we have more immediate problems. We have to get this ship fixed. Leo, what do we need? The easiest thing is tar. Leo was glad to change the subject. We can get that in the city, at a roofing supply store or some place like that. Also, celestial bronze and lime. According to Festus, we can find both of those on an island in the lake, just west of here. We'll have to hurry, Hazel warned. If I know Octavian, he's searching for us with his auguries. The Romans will send a strike force after us. It's a matter of honour. Leo felt everyone's eyes on him. Guys, I don't know what happened. Honestly, I... Annabeth raised her hand. We've been talking. We agree it couldn't have been you, Leo. That cold feeling you mentioned. I felt it too. It must have been some sort of magic, either Octavian or Gaia or one of her minions. But until we understand what happened, Frank grunted. How can we, sh how can we be sure it won't happen again? Leo's fingers heated up like they were about to catch fire. One of his powers as a son of Hephaestus was that he could summon flames at will. But he had to be careful not to do so by accident, especially on a ship filled with explosives and flammable supplies. I'm fine now, he insisted, though he wished he could be sure. Maybe we should use the buddy system. Nobody goes anywhere alone. We can leave Piper and Coach Hedge on board with Jason, send one team into town to get tar, another team go after the bronze and the lime. Split up, Percy said. That sounds like a really bad idea. It'll be quicker, Hazel put in. Besides, there's a reason a quest is usually limited to free demigods, right? Annabeth raised her eyebrows as if re reappraising Hazel's merits. You're right. The same reason we needed the Argo too. Outside camp, seven demigods in one place will attract way too much monstrous attention. The ship is designed to conceal and protect us. We should be safe enough on board. But if we go on expeditions, we shouldn't travel in groups larger than three. No sense alerting more of Gaia's minions than we have to. Percy still didn't look happy about it, but he took Annabeth's hand. As long as you're my buddy, I'm good. Hazel smiled. Oh, that's easy. Frank, you were amazing turning into a dragon. Could you do it again to fly Annabeth and Percy into town for the st for the tar? Frank opened his mouth like he wanted to protest. I I suppose, but what about you? I'll ride with Arian, with, sa with, with, with Leo here. She fidgeted with his her sword hilt, which made Leo uneasy. She had even more nervous energy than he did. We'll get the bronze and the line. We can all meet back here by dark. Frank scowled. 
Obviously, he didn't like the idea of Leo going off with Hazel. For some reason, Frank's disapproval made Leo want to go. He had to prove he was trustworthy. He wasn't going to fire any random ballastay again. Leo, said Annabeth, if we get the supplies, how long to fix the ship? With luck, just a few hours. Fine, she decided. We'll meet you back here as soon as possible, but stay safe. We could use some good luck. That doesn't mean we'll get it. Chapter 6. Leo. Riding Arian was the best thing that had happened to Leo all day, which wasn't saying much, since his day had sucked. The horse's hooves turned the surface of the lake to salty mist. Leo put his hand against the horse's side and felt the muscles working like a well-oiled machine. For the first time he understood why car engines were measured in horsepower. Arian was a four-legged Maserati. Ahead of them lay an island, a line of sand so white it might have been pure table salt. Behind that rose an expanse of grassy dunes and weathered boulders. Leo sat behind Hazel, one arm around her waist. The close contact made him a little uncomfortable, but it was the only way he could stay on board, or whatever you called it, with a horse. Before they left, Percy had pulled him aside to tell him Hazel's story. Percy made it sound like he was just doing Leo a favour, but there'd been an undertone like, if you mess with my friend, I will personally feed you to a great white shark. According to Percy, Hazel was a daughter of Pluto. She died in the 1940s and been brought back to life only a few months ago. Leo found that hard to believe, Hazel seemed warm and very alive, not like the ghosts or the other reborn mortals Leo had tangled with. She seemed good with people too, unlike Leo, who was much more comfortable with machines. Living stuff, like horses and girls, he had no idea what made them work. Hazel was also Frank's girlfriend, so Leo knew he should keep his distance. Still, her hair smelled good, and riding with her made his heart race almost against his will. It must have been the speed of the horse. Arian thundered into the beach. He stomped his hooves and whinnied triumphantly, like Coach Hedge yelling a battle cry. Hazel and Leo dismounted. Arion poured the sand. He needs to eat, Hazel explained. He likes gold, but... Gold? Leo asked. He'll settle for grass. Go on, Arion. Thanks for the ride. I'll call you. Just like that, the horse was gone. Nothing left but a steaming trail across the lake. Fast horse, Leo said. And expensive to feed? Not really, Hazel said. Gold is easy for me. Leo raised his eyebrows. How is gold easy? Please tell me you're not related to King Midas. I don't like that guy. Hazel pursed her lips, as if she regretted raising the subject. Never mind. That made Leo even more curious, but he decided it might be better not to press her. He knelt and cupped a handful of white sand. Well, one problem solved anyway. This is lime. Hazel frowned. The whole beach? Yeah, see? The granules are perfectly round. It's not really sand, it's calcium carbonate. Leo pulled an airtight bag from his tool belt and dug his hand into the lime. Suddenly he froze. He remembered all the times the earth goddess Gaia had appeared to him in the ground, her sleeping face made of dust or sand or soil. She loved to taunt him. He imagined her closed eyes and her dreaming smile swirling in the white calcium. Walk away, little hero, Gaia said. Without you, the ship cannot be fixed. Leo? Hazel asked. You okay? He took a shaky breath. Gaia wasn't here. He was just freaking himself out. Yeah, he said. Uh, yeah, fine. He started to fill the bag. Hazel knelt next to him and helped. We should have brought a pail and shovels. The idea cheered Leo up. He even smiled. We could have made a sandcastle. A lime castle. Their eyes locked for a second too long. Hazel looked away. You are so much alike. Sammy? Leo guessed. She fell backwards. You know. I have no idea who Sammy is, but Frank asked me if I was sure that wasn't my name. And it isn't? No, geez. You don't have a twin brother, or... Hazel stopped. Is your family from New Orleans? Nah, Houston. Why? Is Sammy a guy you used to know? I, uh, it's, it's nothing. You just, you just look like him. Leo could tell she was too embarrassed to say more, but if Hazel was a kid from the past, did that mean Sammy was from the 1940s? If so, how could Frank know the guy? And why would Hazel think Leo was Sammy, all these decades later? They finished filling the bag in silence. Leo stuffed it in his tool belt and the bag vanished. No weight, no mass, no volume. Though, Leo knew it would be there as soon as he reached for it. Anything that could fit into the pockets, Leo could tote around. He loved his tool belt. He just wished the pockets were large enough for a chainsaw or maybe a bazooka. He stood and scanned the island. Bleach white dunes, blankets of grass and boulders encrusted with salt-like frosting. Festus said there was celestial bronze close by, but I'm not sure where. That way. Hazel pointed up the beach, about 500 yards. How do you, uh... Precious metals, Hazel said. It's a Pluto thing. Leah remembered what she'd said about gold being easy. Handy talent. Lead the way, Miss Metal Detector. The sun began to set. The sky turned a bizarre mix of purple and yellow. 
In another reality, Leo might have enjoyed a walk on the beach with a pretty girl, but the further they went, the edgier he, fe he felt. Finally, Hazel turned inland. You sure this is a good idea, he asked. We're close, she promised. Come on. Just over the dunes, they saw a woman. She sat on a boulder in the middle of a grassy field. A black and chrome motorcycle was parked nearby, but each of the wheels had a big pie slice removed from the spokes and rim so that they resembled Pac-Man. No way was the bike drivable in that condition. The woman had curly black hair and a bony frame. She wore black leather biker's pants, tall leather boots and a blood red leather jacket. Sort of a Michael Jackson joins the Hell's Angels look. Around her feet, the ground was littered with what looked like broken shells. She was hunched over, pulling new ones out of a sack and cracking them open. Shucking oysters. Leo wasn't sure if there were oysters in the Great Salt Lake. He didn't think so. He wasn't anxious to approach. He'd had bad experiences with strange ladies. His old babysitter, Tia Kalida, had turned out to be Hera and had a nasty habit of putting him down for naps in blazing fireplaces. The earth goddess Gaia had killed his mother in a workshop fire when Leo was eight. The snow goddess Kioni had tried to turn him into a frozen dairy treat in Sonoma. But Hazel forged ahead, so he didn't have much choice except to follow. As they got closer, Leo noticed disturbing details. Attached to the woman's belt was a curled whip. Her red leather jacket had a subtle design to it, twisted branches of an apple tree populated with skeletal birds. The oysters she was shucking were actually fortune cookies. A pile of broken cookies lay ankle deep all around her. She kept pulling new ones from her sack, cracking them open and reading the fortunes. Most she tossed aside, a few made her mutter unhappily. She would swipe her finger over the slip of paper like she was smudging it, then magically reseal the cookie and toss it into a nearby basket. What are you doing? Leo asked before he could stop himself. The woman looked up. Leo's lungs filled so fast he thought they might burst. Aunt Rosa? he asked. It didn't make sense, but this woman looked exactly like his aunt. She had the same broad nose and the mole on one side, the same sour mouth and hard eyes. But it couldn't be Rosa. She would never wear clothes like that and she was still down in Houston, as far as Leo knew. She wouldn't be cracking open fortune cookies in the middle of the Great Salt Lake. Is that what you see? the woman asked. Interesting. And you, Hazel, dear, how did you... Hazel stepped back in alarm. You, you look like Mrs. Lear, my third grade teacher. I hated you. The woman cackled. Excellent. You resented her, eh? She judged you unfairly. You, she, she taped my hands to the desk for misbehaving, Hazel said. She called my mother a witch. She blamed me for everything I didn't do and, no, no, she has to be dead. Who are you? Oh, Leo knows, the woman said. How do you feel about Aunt Rosa, mijo? Mijo. That's what Leo's mum had always called him. After his mum died, Rosa had rejected Leo. She'd called him a devil child. She blamed him for the fire that had killed her sister. Rosa had turned his family against him and left him. A scrawny, orphaned eight-year-old at the mercy of social services. Leo had bounced around from foster home to foster home until he finally, finally found a home at Camp Halfblood. Leo didn't hate many people, but after all these years, Aunt Rosa's face made him boil with resentment. How did he feel? He wanted to get even. He wanted revenge. His eyes drifted to the motorcycle with the Pac-Man wheels. Where... Had he seen something like that before? Cabin 16, back at a camp half-blood. The symbol above their door was a broken wheel. Nemesis, he said. You're the goddess of revenge. You see, the goddess smiled at Hazel. He recognises me. Nemesis cracked another cookie and wrinkled her nose. You will have great fortune when you least expect it, she said. That's exactly the sort of nonsense I hate. Someone opens a cookie and suddenly they have a prophecy that they'll be rich. I blame the tramp Teich always dispensing good luck to people who don't deserve it. Leo looked at the mound of broken cookies. Uh, you know those aren't real prophecies, right? They're just stuffed in the cookies at some factory. Don't try to excuse it, Nemesis snapped. It's just like Teich to get people's hopes up. No, no, I must counter her. Nemesis flicked a finger over the slip of paper and the letters changed to red. You will die painfully when you most expect it. There, much better. That's horrible, Hazel said. You'd let someone read that in their fortune cookie. And it would come true. Nemesis sneered. It really was creepy seeing that expression on Aunt Rosa's face. My dear Hazel, haven't you ever wished horrible things on Mrs. Lear for the way she treated you? That didn't mean I wanted them to come true. Bah! <laughs> the goddess resealed the cookie and tossed it in her basket. Taish would be Fortuna for you, I suppose, being Roman. Like the others, she's in a horrible way right now. Me? I'm not affected. I'm called Nemesis in both Greek and Roman. I do not change because revenge is universal. What are you talking about? Leo asked. What are you doing here? Nemesis opened another cookie. Lucky numbers. Ridiculous. That's not even a proper fortune. She crushed the cookie and scattered the pieces around her feet. To answer your question, Leo Valdez, the gods are in terrible shape. 
It always happens when a civil war is brewing between you Romans and Greeks. The Olympians are torn between their two natures, called on by both sides. They become quite schizophrenic, I'm afraid, splitting headaches, disorientation. But we're not at war, Leo insisted. Um, Leo, Hazel winced, except for the fact that you recently blew up large sections of New Rome. Leo stared at her, wondering whose side she was on. Not on purpose. I know, Hazel said, but the Romans don't realise that, and they'll be pursuing us in retaliation. Nemesis cackled. Leo, listen to the girl. War is coming. Gaia has seen to it with your help. And can you guess whom the gods blame for their predicament? Leo's mouth tasted like calcium carbonate. Me? The goddess snorted. Well, don't you have a high opinion of yourself. You're just a pawn on the chessboard, Leo Valdez. I was referring to the player who set this ridiculous quest in motion, bringing the Greeks and Romans together. The gods blame Hera, or Juno if you prefer, the queen of the heavens who fled, has fled Olympus to escape the wrath of her family. Don't expect any more help from your patron. Leo's head throbbed. He had mixed feelings about Hera. She'd meddled in his life since he was a baby, moulding him to serve her purpose in this big prophecy. But at least she had been on their side, more or less, if she was out of the picture now. So why are you here? He asked. Why to offer my help? Nemesis smiled wickedly. Leo glanced at Hazel. She looked like she'd just been offered a free snake. Your help, Leo said. Of course, said the goddess. I enjoy tearing down the prou proud and powerful, and there are none who deserve tearing down like Gaia and her giants. Still, I must warn you that I will not suffer undeserved success. Good luck is a sham. The Wheel of Fortune is a Ponzi scheme. True success requires sacrifice. Sacrifice? Hazel's voice was tight. I lost my mother. I died and came back. Now my brother is missing. Isn't that enough sacrifice for you? Leo could totally relate. He wanted to scream that he'd lost his mum too. His whole life had been one misery after another. He'd lost his dragon, Festus. He'd nearly killed himself trying to finish the Argo too. Now he'd fired on the Roman camp, most likely started a war and maybe lost the trust of his friends. Right now, he said, trying to control his anger, all I want is some celestial bronze. Oh, that's easy, Nemesis said. It's just over the rise. You'll find it with the sweethearts. Wait, Hazel said. What sweethearts? Nemesis popped a cookie in her mouth and swallowed it, fortune and all. You'll see. Perhaps they will teach you a lesson, Hazel Levesque. Most heroes cannot escape their nature, even when given a second chance at life. She smiled. And speaking of your brother, Nico, you don't have much time. Let's see. It's June 25th. Yes, after today, six more days. Then he dies, along with the entire city of Rome. Hazel's eyes widened. How? What? And as for you, child of fire, she turned to Leo, your worst hardships are yet to come. You will always be the outsider, the seventh wheel. You will not find a place among your brethren. Soon you will face a problem you cannot solve, though I could help you for a price. Leo smelled smoke. He realised the fingers on his left hand were ablaze and Hazel was staring at him in terror. He shoved his hand in his pocket to extinguish the flames. I like to solve my own problems. Very well. Nemesis brushed cookie dust off her jacket. But, um, what sort of price are we talking about? The goddess shrugged. One of my children recently traded an eye for the ability to make a real difference in the world. Leo's stomach churned. You... you want an eye? In your case, perhaps another sacrifice would do, but something just as painful. Here. She handed him an unbroken fortune cookie. If you need an answer, break this. It will solve your problem. Leo's hand trembled as he held the fortune cookie. What problem? You'll know when the time comes. No thanks, Leo said firmly, but his hand as though it had a will of its own, slipped the cookie into his tool belt. Nemesis picked another cookie from her bag and cracked it open. You will have cause to reconsider your choices soon. Oh, I like that one. No changes needed here. She resealed the cookie and tossed it into the basket. Very few gods will be able to help you on the quest. Most are already incapacitated, and their confusion will only grow worse. One thing might bring unity to Olympus again. An old wrong finally avenged. Ah, that would be sweet indeed. The scales finally balanced but it will not happen unless you accept and my help. I suppose you won't tell us what you're talking about, Hazel muttered, or why my brother Nico has only six days to live, or why Rome is going to be destroyed. Nemesis chuckled. She rose and slung her sack of cookies over her shoulder. Oh, it's all tied together, Hazel Levesque. As for my offer, Leo Valdez, give it some thought. You're a good child, a hard worker. You would do business. You could do business. But I have detained you too long. You should visit the reflecting pool before the light fades. My poor cursed boy gets quiet. Well, quite agitated. When the darkness comes. Leo didn't like the sound of that, but the goddess climbed on her motorcycle. Apparently it was drivable, despite those Pac-Man-shaped wheels, because Nemesis revved her engine and disappeared in a mushroom cloud of black smoke. Hazel bent down. All the broken cookies and fortunes had disappeared except for one crumpled slip of paper. 
She picked it up and read, You will see yourself reflected, and you will have reason to despair. Fantastic, Leo grumbled. Let's go see what that means.